Okay, it looks like uh, attendees have stabilized now. So welcome everybody to the TI, Apply and RU European Road Freight Rate Development Benchmark for Q3 uh, 2021. I'm very pleased uh, to welcome you all today to discuss freight rate development over the last quarter and what we can expect in the coming months. Um, just before we get started, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, the webinar presentation itself will last about 30 minutes uh, this afternoon, uh, and then we'll move on to a Q&A session. So uh, do please feel free to submit your questions via the Q&A tool on the uh, Zoom webinar system throughout the course of the presentation, and uh, we'll do our best to answer as many as we possibly can uh, at the end of the presentation. Now, obviously, when we're looking at road freight rate development over the last quarter, and particularly thinking uh, across the whole of Q3, uh, it's been a very interesting quarter with an awful lot of challenges for the whole European road freight industry, really. Um, I, we've all been struggling with driver shortages, uh, with some considerable volatility in the market, port disruption, all of which has made quite a challenging environment for, for the road freight market. And to be honest, that uh, much of that is still continuing uh, as we speak. Uh, now as well. Um, we've also seen across uh, Europe really general price uh, increases occur over the course of the quarter and we'll be going into uh, a bit more detail on all of those topics as we go uh, through the webinar today. Now I'm Michael Clover, I'm your host uh, from Transport Intelligence uh, and I'm also joined by Nick Bailey, uh, TI's Head of Research. Um, TI itself is a, a leading source of market intelligence for the logistics industry and one of our specialisations uh, is to provide strategic data on the road freight market. So Nick will be very happy to share his views on the development of the market uh, today. And uh, Nick. Hi Michael, great to be here. Uh, I'm also uh, have the pleasure on this uh, occasion to be joined by uh, Marianne Savoni from IU uh, and IU are joining us uh, for the first time with this quarter's uh, webinar, uh, so offer their expertise and, and viewpoint as a representative uh, for the whole uh, road transport industry. So we're very pleased to have Marianne joining us today. Hello, Marianne. Hi, to are very happy to be there. Uh, and finally, I'm also joined by uh, Thomas Aru from uh, Apply, who's uh, now Chief Executive Officer of Apply, actually, and he's very happy to offer his view on uh, on road freight rate development this quarter, but also to take a closer look at some of the applied data uh, and explain a little bit more about some of the methodologies and how the data uh, is compiled. So welcome, Thomas. And would you like just to give a quick overview of uh, apply and, and the data we'll be looking at today? Yeah, thank you, Michael. Hi, everybody. I'm just looking at the numbers. There are a bit more than 330 people connected. This is great. Uh, hello, everybody. So, of course, uh, with pleasure to introduce Apply. Apply is a, is a tool, a digital platform that is dedicated to the supply chain. And we provide several services, including one that is a benchmarking tool uh, that allow, uh, allows our users to have a look at market data and market prices. Uh, in air freight, sea freight, but also in road transportation. And here we will have the, this focus here on road transportation. Thank you, Thomas. Well, I think uh, it's time that we dive into some of the data. And we like to start with these webinars uh, really by looking at the overall uh, European picture um, and looking at the sort of average rate development across the whole of Europe. And then as we go through the presentation, we'll dive in to look at some um, particular lanes and the actual uh, Euro value prices paid on those. Uh, over the quarter. Um, but as we can see, uh, this is the index for the whole of Europe. Uh, we see a, a market with uh, some considerable price increases there uh, over the last few quarters. But uh, Nick, would you like to uh, give us your view on uh, what's driving that development? Absolutely. So we can see that the TI apply an IOU European Road Freight Benchmark at an all time high in Q3 2021. And that high comes thanks to a mix of strong economic growth, of global supply chain bottlenecks, of rising costs and of scarce capacity across the region. Uh, the benchmark is 0.9% higher than in Q2 this year, and it's 2.9% higher than a year ago. Uh, and in euro terms, the benchmark index has hit 1,095 euros for this quarter. Q3 2021 is the fifth consecutive quarter during which the benchmark has risen, uh, when I 4% higher compared to that low that we can see in Q2 2020, when the worst of the pandemic disruptions were being felt across the region. Uh, rising rates since then track economic and social reopenings across Europe, and they also highlight the role the road freight 
uh, plays in supporting wider economic growth uh, and also covers a period which has seen some supply chain uh, challenges. So we've seen congestion, bottlenecks, supply shortages, capacity issues and rising costs as well. Uh, and its retail and manufacturing sectors across the region have reopened and we've seen demand rise steeply. Um, the, those challenges have intensified. So a shortage of semiconductors, for example, is suppressing manufacturing activity. And that's particularly the case in Europe's automotive sector, where we've seen production schedules reduced at major OEMs. That includes Renault, BMW, Mercedes, and that's across Germany, France, and Spain, just one example. Uh, and more widely, we've seen PMI numbers in new order books uh, fall from highs closer to that neutral 50 mark as some of these challenges start to bite the manufacturer's ability to get their production schedules uh, up and running in the way that they would want to to meet the demand that we're seeing. Uh, costs are also rising for road freight providers and inflation's on the horizon. Uh, carriers across Europe will be watching the price of diesel extremely closely day to day, no doubt at this point in time. In Germany, diesel prices ended Q3 2021 38.5% higher per litre than they were at the end of Q3 2020. In the UK, diesel prices are up 27%. In Spain, that rises 25%. In France and Italy, that rises over 20% in both of those compared to the same period in 2020. Perhaps though, the most challenging, uh, the most pressing challenge that we've seen in the quarter is that of driver shortages. Uh, the UK has experienced the most acute effects of those driver shortages in the third quarter. There have been supermarket shelves that are empty and fuel stations which are empty uh, across the country. Uh, and that's been the result really of too few drivers being available to move goods. And right now, as we head into peak season, the UK is around 100,000 drivers short. In Germany, that number is upwards of 60,000 drivers. Uh, and really, it's a region-wide challenge, uh, driver shortages. And we see that uh, those shortages in countries like Spain and France, for example. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, driver shortages have been a really pressing issue and obviously leading to lots of stockouts in the UK and petrol shortages and that sort of thing. But as Nick says, it's not just a UK issue. Um, actually, Marianne, I know you've done some uh, research from the IU on, uh, on driver shortages across uh, France and Spain, particularly, and also looking at cost increases in those uh, countries. So perhaps you could talk us through how those have been affecting uh, overall prices as well. Yeah, uh, in fact, the, 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 the driver shortage is quite rising up again indeed this year. Um, the growth and the economic recovery are in fact accelerating or even in phasing the existing shortage issue that we all know. Um, the main reasons behind this, this key issue of the road transport industry is mainly linked first uh, to the lack of attractiveness of the profession, um, the hard working condition, the poor image of the profession, and also the low female employment are the main reasons of, the, of this lack of attractiveness. Um, just as a reference, uh, only 2% of the, of the truck drivers are female in, in Europe uh, as, of, uh, as of today. Um, the, also, the, the other reason also that is key is the aging driver population due to uh, the low attractiveness of young people, uh, which is quite clear uh, during these uh, last months. Uh, as a reference as well, 44 years is the, uh, the, the age in average of truck drivers in Europe. Um, the last reason, which is a, a key one, is the fact that there is a higher level of quality and certification which is required to become a professional driver. Uh, meaning difficulties to access a profession. And many countries in Europe uh, today are trying to, um, to find solutions with the, the different governments in order to find the ways to ease uh, the access to the profession. Mm -hmm. yes, thank you, Marianne. It really is uh, proving to be a broken strain to capacity and we can see all of those challenges uh, in the market. I know a lot of uh, road freight operators trying hard to try and overcome and compete for drivers, but. Uh, there's that real structural demographic challenge as well. Um, okay, well, that's the overall European picture. Obviously, we can see from that point of view, price is really rising, but I think it's also important to say that there's a lot of variation, um, you know, on different lanes right across Europe. Um, and, uh, you know, through this uh, partnership, we look at uh, 36 different international lanes uh, in detail, and you can see uh, just some of those uh, covered here on this particular uh, map to show you the uh, breadth of coverage. Um, Thomas, I, I wonder if you'd like just to talk through the coverage of the applied data and uh, perhaps any new regions or data that you've added over the last quarter. 
Yeah, thank you. The, I will be very quick on this point, but here what is interesting on the map is that we are covering a huge part of, of Europe. We are focusing is here on the top corridors, uh, but on the website you can set uh, any uh, on apply website you can set any origin destination and then have a, a benchmarking view with a kind of confidence index regarding the data, the level and the amount of data that we have. What, what is interesting in this map is to see also the difference between uh, um, the, the way in and out uh, to, from a certain origin and destination, the inbound, inbound and outbound. And if we look at uh, Spain to, uh, to, to UK, for instance, uh, the, the, the difference is quite huge. And this is the case in, in, many, in many places also. But we'll have a, a more deep dive on it in the following graphs. Yes, absolutely. But it is uh, very worth pointing out, particularly when we're going to be looking at, uh, you know, the cross channel lanes uh, a bit later on, yeah, how much uh, difference there is there and how that is affecting the, uh, the market uh, dynamic itself. Um, okay, well, let's dive into, uh, you know, the first of our, of our lanes um, today then. Uh, this one is uh, one of the highest volume lanes in Europe, and we like to take a look at uh, the three highest, uh, highest volume lanes each, uh, each quarter. In this case, we're looking at um, Madrid, Paris uh, and rate development uh, across this particular lane. So Marianne, would you be able to talk us through this one? Yeah, so um, as we observe in the, in the graph, the rates between Paris and Madrid took a divergent path in Q3 with a four in, the, in, the, in rates for Paris-Madrid direction. The year-on-year -year rates from Madrid to Paris have risen 6.4%, uh, exceeding the level seen for Paris-Madrid direction for the first time in a year. This decline observed for Paris Madrid lane is mainly due to the Spanish PMI slowdown during the quarter. Uh, indeed, the automotive sector plays a, a key role uh, in, the, in the trade and in development, um, in the rate development on the lane. And the automotive sector represents the first product exchange on the lane, so that is why the impact is quite high. Um, the supply constraints are putting high pressure on the EU's automotive sector, globally speaking, and led to partial disruption in Spain over the Q3, which is not really linked with the semiconductor uh, shortage. Also, what we can say that the demand in France provided an, an upward lift to rates, which is, however, supported by a dynamic domestic economy. Um, the increase of food sales notably pushed the demand for agricultural products. Uh, cereals, uh, as a reference, represent the first product uh, traded on this lane. Um, and there is also an increase of retail sales with a rising 2.8% month on month in September. The, the, the last point is that the cost factors have also impacted rates, notably in the Spanish market, with a 25% rise in diesel prices in the beginning of the, of the year. In the meantime, truck driver shortage could reach an estimated 10% in Spain and France uh, versus uh, an estimated driver shortage for 2020 of 4% meaning more in an absolute number than 20k truck drivers jobs are unfilled in Spain and about 40k uh, are, uh, are, are unfilled in France. On the top of all this, the average maintenance repair cost has increased by 8.5% over the last 10 years in France. So this is what we can say on this lane. Mm, yes, thank you, Marianne. And that's a a picture we're seeing across a, a lot of lanes really, I suppose, uh, you know, cost pressures pushing up rates, capacity constraints and driver shortages, uh, and obviously all that demand as well, particularly agriculture and, um, and automotive on this particular lane. So um, thanks for that. We'll turn now, I think, to um, uh, another uh, very high volume lane from uh, Warsaw to Duisburg to Poland, uh, Germany. Nick, could you take us through this one, please? Uh, absolutely. So the Lanes between Warsaw and Duisburg have seen some volatility in recent quarters, and that's really come as both the German and Polish economies have sparked back into some post-lockdown life. Uh, rates into Duisburg particularly have seen uh, a bit what been subject to some fluctuating demands in Germany's manufacturing sector over the last year. Those are up 2.8% quarter on quarter and 2.7% year on year. Uh, and Germany is actually one of those countries across Europe where we've started to, to, to see PMI numbers slipping. So at 58.4 in September, the reading is still pretty healthy in terms of uh, PMI, uh, reading above 50 and indicating uh, neutral expansion. Uh, but it's also the lowest in eight months, and that's really highlighting some of the challenges faced in the German manufacturing sector. 
Uh, and that kind of brings us back around to the global supply chain, uh, global semiconductor shortage, uh, which is really hurting the German automotive sector. Uh, so there's reduced activity and longer term production schedules have been cut already in Germany. Uh, and it's those semiconductor shortages which have really forced the OEM's hands. Uh, BMW began Q3 by announcing an expectation that production problems would be experienced throughout the second half of 2021. Uh, and Daimler's already uh, been reducing production schedule at least three German plants uh, over the second half of this year and into 2022 as well. Uh, but positives for this lane come from external demand for German goods. So that's essentially demand for German made goods from other countries in Europe, which is supporting those longer manufacturing supply chains, which cross the Polish and German border. Uh, and it's also coming from German uh, consumer demand as well, which is pretty healthy. And it's the combination of those two factors which are providing the upward pressure on rates into Duisburg from Wolfsburg. Mm. Uh, thank you, Nick. Yes, it's uh, it obviously such a lane dominated by manufacturing, really, and that impact on automotive makes such a big difference. But uh, uh, obviously, other ca factors countering that as well. Um, so the next thing, this is also uh, involving Germany, it's Duisburg to, to Paris as well. Um, bit less uh, volatility on, on this lane, they're still rising, as we can see here. Thomas, could you take us through this one, please? Yes, of course. Uh, the, um, I mean, this lane is particularly interesting in the sense that we see a huge increase between the Q2 uh, 20 and the Q3 21. So from the during the pandemic to, to now, the increase is, is about 20 percent, so it's very high. Uh, of course, the pandemic was was uh, uh, was eating at this point and so the demand was lower uh, and, and the prices were lower but here we can see clearly a very high price uh, from uh, Duisburg to Paris and this highlights the fact that France uh, demand is uh, starting to, to, to boost again and is at a very high uh, level uh, and basically France uh, is asking for gem German imports and importing a lot from, uh, from, from Germany uh, very recently, the, the CAC 40, the top uh, 40 companies in France, uh, hit the high time record of picking uh, above the, the prices and the, the stock options from 20, uh, uh, 2000 uh, records. So we have a very high demand, a very good economy uh, in France right now, boosted by the, the demand and the consumption from the uh, from the household. So this is why also we have a very strong import, uh, importing uh, uh, behavior from Germany. Mm. Yeah, it's uh, certainly uh, French economy recovering uh, quite strongly from, um, uh, you know, from the, from the pandemic. And I think uh, expectations are to have fully recovered by the end of 2021. So that's really driving um, some of the growth that we see uh, here. Um, and actually, it uh, brings us on to the next slide there, which is um, so looking at uh, applied freight index, the UFI, looking at uh, French domestic rates. And we're very pleased to be able to include these um, in this quarter's review. Um, previously, we've always focused on international lanes. So it's uh, great to be able to take a look at some of the domestic pricing as well. And, and as I say, this quarter, we're featuring uh, French uh, domestic uh, rates. Thomas, could you introduce us to the UI, UFI, please? Yes, I will mainly uh, look at how we built the, the UFI because as you can see, the, you see the rates over there and it's quite aligned with all the comments that we have made for, since the beginning from the driver shortage, from the boost of the French economy and, 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 that's, and all of the rest. So here the idea is to aggregate prices directly, spot and contractual prices. So this is important. We have here both. Uh, we have also the ability on, the, on our website to distinguish to, to have both separately of the spots on the, on the side and the, and the market view contractual on, on the other side. Uh, the idea is to aggregate the price for full truck load. So this is important also, but we aggregate a lot of data for full trucks in France. Uh, and we take a point to point destination, a bit of uh, Paris to, uh, to Lyon, to, from Marseille to Lille, for instance. We aggregate that into an index. And here we have the view to, to sense uh, what are the fluctuations regarding the euro, euro kilometer price? Uh, and we have here the, the peak, and we can see also on the next uh, slide the, um, the, the fluctuation between one year to another. Uh, and we, high, we are in 2021 at a high, a very high level compar compared to 2020 or even 2019. Mm. Yes, thank you, Thomas. And actually, we can see some of that when we take a look at the next chart, which is looking at uh, overall pricing development um, over the last 
um, three years or so. So as, as Thomas was saying, um, you know, you can really see uh, that we're operating at such a higher price point uh, now than we have done over the last uh, few years. Any other comments to, to make on that, Thomas? Uh, no, this was mainly this point. As you can see also, we have a, a seasonality, a kind of seasonality in, in France where uh, rates increases by the end of the year. And we see right now that we are higher than the past, the previous uh, rates from the, the previous uh, years. And we, we think that the prices will keep growing, especially by the end of the, of the year. And we need to see on 20, uh, 2022, but yes, the, the sense is that the seasonality will come and then we need to see how the driver shortage, how the demand will keep increasing to see what might be the impact on the prices. Mm, yes. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much, Thomas. Um, so the next uh, lane that we're looking at really is identifying like, the lane which had the, one of the biggest changes over the last uh, quarter. So in this case, looking at uh, Duisburg Milan, um, which has seen some pretty uh, significant price changes there. Nick, could you take us through this one? Uh, absolutely. So you're entirely right to say this is a significant price change. Rates between Duisburg and Milan are up 10.4% year on year. And that's one of the biggest growth rates that we've seen across the whole benchmark, uh, the whole set of benchmark lanes for a long time. Uh, in the other direction, rates have also gone up. Those are 3.7% higher year on year. Uh, it's really Italy's manufacturing sector that's playing a key role in this. Uh, it's seen some rapid growth in 2021 with production levels rising and new orders also rising at a really healthy rate. Uh, and that's also particularly the case for export orders to Germany, which IHS market in its PMI for Italy manufacturing sector in September 2021 uh, described as rising steeply. Uh, and the other side of the, the equation here is Italian imports, and they've rebounded really strongly following the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, demand's healthy across Italy's private sector, and there's sustained demand throughout the quarter across manufacturing, services, and construction. And the relationship between Germany and Italy is important here. So Germany is Italy's largest import porter, uh, partner. Around 16% of all imports into Italy come from Germany. And those are weighted quite heavily towards road freight intensive manufactured intermediate and consumer goods. So that's the dynamics that we're seeing playing out at the moment. Mm. Yeah, and driving those price, price increases. Now, obviously we uh, talk a lot about how prices have developed and what's really driving that through these webinars. But as Thomas actually just mentioned, we also like to um, take a look at lanes that we expect to see some significant um, you know, price changes on, um, you know, uh, in the future as well. So we like to include a lane to watch to, to give you a bit of a sense of what may occur uh, over the next quarter. And in this case, uh, we've picked uh, Leo to London, um, which uh, obviously cross channel lane, and you can see a very large discrepancy between um, you know, the uh, outbound and return legs uh, on this particular lane. Um, Marianne, could you take us through the dynamics here? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, across 2021, road freight lanes into and out of the UK have experienced a changing supply demand picture, um, mainly resulting from the, the mix of different factors, which are um, the Brexit, uh, of course, the Java shortage, as was mentioned before, um, the global supply chain bottlenecks, and also the, the reopening of the economies on the on the both sides of the of the lane. Um, Rates have significantly declined on UK inbound lanes due to the fall in cross-channel traffic. Um, also, the rates on UK exports to Lille have increased up to 9.6% in Q3 um, year on year. Uh, the, this data reveals that the majority of this rise uh, occurred, in fact, during the, the months uh, immediately after the Brexit. And, since has persisted um, uh, during this quarter. Looking ahead, um, volumes on this lane are expected to increase up to the end of 2021, uh, mainly due uh, to the implementation of the border controls on the EU to UK bound freight on the 1st of January 2022, um, for two reasons. First, uh, importers, a uh, cool stock uh, prior to potential disruption, uh, which is, of course, putting pressure on rates. Second reason is that after the, the 1st of January, there is an expectation of a period of disruption to imports, leading to potential pressure as well on, on rates. 
So this is what we can say on on this uh, on this lane. Yes, it's uh, certainly a lane in which we anticipate um, you know big changes over Q4 and into Q1, as you say there, uh, Marianne, based around some of those changes to uh, import uh, customs processes, uh, you know, coming in in January. Um, and uh, actually, we've also got some data here, which is looking at uh, expectations for overall uh, movements, uh, basically, of HGVs over uh, the next year or so, um, and the forecast for 2021. So, Nick, I don't know if you could take us through this quickly. Uh, certainly, yeah. I think uh, Marianne's done a fantastic job of describing the dynamics that we're seeing in, uh, in pricing on uh, cross-channel routes, especially between Lille and London there. Uh, but this is looking at the, the kind of same dynamics from a slightly different perspective. This is the, the number of trucks which are moving into and out of the UK across the channel. Uh, and this comes from data drawn from the UK's ONS. Uh, and we've been able to take that and turn it into some forecasts looking ahead of the full year 2021. Um, and we can see the based on our expectations, uh, movements of HGV trucks into the UK from the European Union is set to fall around 15% year on year in 2021. And I'd also mention to everyone that that is uh, compared to the base year of 2020, which was obviously significantly impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, specifically looking at French registered trucks in their movements into the UK, we're expecting around a 12% fall year on year in 2021. Uh, but this change is happening in both directions. So we can also see based on our forecasts that truck movements from the UK into the EU could fall by more than 20% this year. Uh, that's obviously a huge uh, a huge fall off in the volume of truck movements uh, and we can link that to some trade data uh, so we can look at the difference between uh, trade between the UK and France in Q2 in, in 2021 uh, and compare that to Q1 2019 and we see almost 30% less trade in goods between the two countries uh, so not only we're we seeing fewer um, truck movements post-Brexit we're also seeing a lot uh, less trade between the UK and some of its European partners uh, post Brexit. Uh, that's coming across in trade data, it's coming across in these HGV movements, and it's also coming across quite clearly in the dynamics on pricing on the lanes as well. Mm. It's interesting though for the uh, cross channel lane to look at that dynamic, um, looking at falling volumes, which ordinarily may have a, you know, a negative effect on and to bring rates down in normal conditions, but the complexity of the situation um, and the shortage of capacity and constraints, as well as the um, difficulties around, you know, not having a return node and having to price in, uh, you know, that empty trip back from uh, the UK back across the channel, uh, does make it quite a complex lane in terms of uh, the impact that lower volumes could have. Um, so it's quite interesting to see, see the effects there, but how sometimes these things don't necessarily go along with the theory as, as they normally would. Okay, that's brilliant. So that's our final slide in terms of lanes that we're taking a closer look at. And we'll move on to our Q&A session in just a moment. But of course, uh, I'm sure there's a few questions on uh, methodology and, and the data itself. Um, so before we turn over to those, I think it would be worth just taking a bit of a look at that methodology as well. Um, and Thomas, you're well placed to take us through this. Yeah, I will, I will use this slide also to answer some of the questions I've seen in the Q&A. First, we are collecting transactional rates, meaning that we are getting invoices directly from partners that are shippers, carriers, freight forwarders. And the point is that these are selling rates from shippers, uh, from carriers, freight forwarders, and buying rates from uh, shippers. Okay, so we are mainly on the buying rates from shippers. Uh, transactional rates, we have both here in the graphs spot and contractual. So we have a view, the view of, on the global market. And this is all included prices, meaning that fuel is in it. On our website and in the database, you might be able to uh, say, OK, I want the, the data without the fuel. I want to have only the spots. I want to have uh, it for the, the temperature control, for instance. But here, this is general cargo, uh, all included, uh, and the contractual plus spot prices that are in, the, in this uh, document. Uh, the, first the first point is that. and. Uh, and, and that's it, then contractual rate collecting uh, from a bit more than, uh, than 1,000 shippers and, and carriers. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Thomas. So uh, hopefully that's dealt with um, you know, some of your questions through uh, seems to be on the, the chat <laughs> rather than the Q&A feature on this particular occasion, but uh, we could manage um, uh, with that. 
Um, the only other questions we've had, I think um, we've answered a few in that chat anyway, but uh, you know, the recording of this session, as well as the um, uh, full PDF uh, report on, on the rates will be um, uh, included um, uh, after and sent out after the uh, presentation. Okay, so we'll just uh, take a, a look at questions there. Um, so we've got a f one really looking at uh, the impact of the mobility package, uh, first of all, um, and it looks like, um, I suppose that's a question that, uh, you know, um, Marianne, you might like to, to speak on perhaps the impact of um, uh, that we might expect the mobility package to have in February. Yeah, so we are uh, currently monitoring this uh, the impact of the of the mobility package. Um, we are going to uh, to launch uh, uh, analysis and report on this on the on the current uh, in the current weeks. Uh, so um, this is something that we are um, uh, strongly monitoring in terms of cost. Uh, uh, effect on the on the on the road transport operators, notably in the Eastern Europe. Uh, so we are uh, closely monitoring the impact in terms of uh, uh, wage, driver cost, and also um, what is going to be the impact in terms of road transportation on the east and uh, eastern and western Europe. Um, but this is something we can uh, we can indeed anyway share uh, all these different detail analysis with the different type of impact. Uh, of the of the mobility package on the on the on the on the freight cost. Okay, thank you, Marianne. Yes, we've also got um, some questions coming through on the uh, Q and A uh, section here, which is looking at uh, sort of the actual impact of of cost fact, different cost factors like fuel on pricing. Um, asking about, uh, for instance, how, what, how much of a share of, of the overall price does um, does fuel have, um, you know, on uh, on total pricing. Um, obviously, that varies quite a lot between different countries. Um, so, uh, you know, in Western European countries, uh, fuel prices will tend to be slightly higher, but also labour and wage costs are obviously much higher as well. Uh, so, in, in Western Europe, we tend to find that say uh, takes a uh, you know a, a a smaller share of pricing, whereas in uh, Central and Eastern Europe, we do tend to see that that has a bit more of, of an influence. So um, that's sort of the, the basic um, dynamics as to uh, as to how that works um, across different um, different countries. Um, there's also, I think, some questions here. One looking at um, the impact of uh, of uh, volumes uh, for sort of the land bridge, so uh, Ireland going to uh, to the European market. Uh, via the via the UK, um, that's uh, data that wouldn't be included. I, I don't think uh, in our in our rates here because we're looking at just rates from in this case London to Lille. Uh, would that be correct, Thomas? Yes, exactly. I was looking exactly at the same questions. Uh, it, it might be interesting to have a look directly on the on certain corridors. We have it, uh, for instance, from Spain to the UK, and clearly the or even to south of France or Italy to the UK. And uh, the peak uh, after the pandemic and after the Brexit is very high, meaning that the prices uh, we have and from carriers, we know that many carriers from Europe don't want to go anymore in the UK. It's too complex. It's too, too much time. Uh, the, and so the prices are, are, are going up. I completely agree with that. Maybe we use a, a view of Lille uh, UK that, uh, that is a bit tricky, but it was interesting for us also to, to put it here. Uh, then if you look at others, uh, I completely agree with the fact that the prices from, UK, from Europe to the UK went up in the past months. Mm. Yes, thank you, Thomas. Nick, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Uh, sure, specifically going back to the EU direct to Ireland, or rather the land bridge around the UK uh, point. So we, we we don't have any direct coverage here, uh, although I'm sure we'll apply those elsewhere. Um, but from our perspective, we are currently working on our European road freight market sizing, looking at the first half in, uh, of this year and the projections through to the end of this year. Um, we're starting to see in wider macroeconomic data, the increase in volumes and the increase in road freight market size. Uh, in the Irish international market uh, specifically. So we can certainly say the early indications are that that's going to be one of the higher growth markets. Uh, looking ahead at our 2025 forecast for the European, uh, sorry, for the Irish international road freight market, it's actually one of the highest growth uh, markets that we have. 
uh, it's a bit unique in terms of Western European markets that its growth rates are much more comparable to some of the, the Central and Eastern European markets. So we're certainly starting to see that come through in wider data. Uh, the, the Irish routes directly to continental Europe are, are taking precedence and carriers, exactly as Thomas said, really are avoiding the UK if they can. Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, so we've got a couple of uh, other sort of uh, questions about other sort of information here. So there's one uh, asking about uh, uh, running information on what list of the top uh, road freight uh, companies in the European market. Um, so that's something that uh, DI would be uh, able to provide um, through our online knowledge platforms if you'd like to have a look at the biggest players in the market and uh, get some of their key metrics and um, strategic information. So that's something we could help you with. Um, another question also asking about wages per country. And again, that's something that, um, that uh, TI uh, would, would be able to help with there, but not, uh, not covered really within this um, uh, particular uh, index. So please do get in touch with us um, if you'd like to um, talk, talk about that. Um, also got another question here on the mobility package, which I think maybe Marianne might uh, want to come in on, um, which is talking about um, uh, the likelihood of being able to abide by uh, rules about staying um, outside of the truck uh, in, over uh, every second weekend for 45 hours uh, breaks and the uh, challenges around, um, you know, not having suitable hotels or facilities to enable that um, and how road freight operators are likely to be able to actually do that. Is that something you'd like to comment on, Marianne? Yeah, and more Mogulay speaking, I can say a word on what IRU is doing on these, these different topics in terms of notably um, working conditions and how we need to um, to integrate the mobility package regulation with the a better, I could say, treatment of drivers. Uh, I could say uh, the first thing that IRU is um, is directly founding uh, the safe and secure parking areas, which is a, an European Commission project. Um, this uh, project is uh, aiming to, to, uh, to create a kind of standard for, for, for the drivers so they can find uh, the good level and the adequate uh, places, for example, to stay and, and, uh, and, and sleep and have better conditions to, to have a rest, I could say. Um, the, 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 the other action that we are uh, also doing is indeed um, uh, the, 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 to, to, we have launched a shorter uh, to improve the treatment of the drivers at the delivery sites. Um, and we try to integrate this dimension in the multi-package uh, discussions we have at the European Commission uh, in order to see how we can indeed uh, integrate uh, a better also treatment and better conditions of working of the drivers at the loading and loading uh, sites. Uh, so globally speaking, we try uh, as an international organization to indeed integrate the, the the, the in, I could say the interest of our road transport industry um, challenge into uh, these new regulations to come. Thank you, Marianne. Yes, it's very interesting to hear about uh, some of the work that uh, IU is doing to uh, deal with some of these changes and um, and offer some some support there. So, uh, thanks for sharing that. Um, there's another question here, which is looking at um, maybe some slightly longer uh, range prices. So, uh, for instance, in this. Um, in this webinar, we cover 36 things and we sort of go as far east as, uh, as Poland and the Czech Republic. Um, but there's a question here um, from uh, Christiana asking about uh, prices for routes from, say, uh, Germany to Romania. Um, so, Thomas, I, I believe Apply uh, is getting increasingly um, good data on uh, those kind of markets. But uh, would you like to uh, come back on that? Uh, yeah, I, I cannot be very specific on this point. I mean, it depends on all the origin destinations and the requirements mm -hmm. that you may have. But of course, the uh, apply is getting bigger and bigger regarding the partnership that it has. And so we, we have more and more data, specifically in, in Western Europe. Uh, to be honest, we have a lack of data in uh, Northern Europe, uh, Norway, Sweden, and a lack of data in Greece or in the Balkanic uh, countries. But in the rest of, of, of Europe, we have a pretty pretty fair data. And on the website directly, you can have access to it. And you can have a, a, an index on the confidence and the coverage that we have. And this is a very important point from my own point of view, because data is good. But if you don't believe and if you don't have confidence in data, then there is no value in it. Uh, so it's very important for us and for the ARU and the NTI that we are transparent in the source of the data and the and the capacity, the volume of data that we have. Mm. 
Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Thomas, as well. Um, so I think we'll uh, have to draw the Q&A session there to an end, but obviously if you do have any further questions, then please do get in touch uh, with, uh, uh, with the IU, with Apply or TI. Um, if you'd like to follow up, you can use the contact details uh, on your screen now to, um, uh, to ask any further questions. We'll be very happy to talk to you uh, about any other issues around the road freight market or indeed on, on road freight rates development. So um, thank you very much for everyone for attending today. It's um, good to have so many of you uh, joining us on the session. And thank you very much to my panelists, to Nick, to Marianne and to Thomas uh, for sharing their views today. And we'll see you next time.